Good morning. Uh, let me begin by thanking my fellow panelists for their hard work, commitment, and wisdom. This has been a team effort with a distinguished and experienced group of panelists, and I'm pleased to say that all of our recommendations were supported unanimously by all panel members. The panel worked hard over the summer reviewing data from the Alberta government and KPMG and interviewing major departments. Our approach was strategic. We focused on the largest departments and the main cost drivers. Our main findings should be of concern to all Albertans. We found that without bold change, Albertans face a future of rising deficits and debt with more and more tax dollars going to interests rather than programs. Delay will only worsen the problem. For instance, if the government of the day had frozen spending in 2016-17, the current deficit would be $3.2 billion less. We found that if Alberta's per capita spending matched the spending of the three other big provinces, Alberta would spend $10.4 billion less annually and would not have a deficit. Worse, while Alberta spends more, the results achieved are no better and in some cases worse than in other provinces. Raising taxes is not the answer. Alberta has a spending problem and the government needs to act quickly and decisively to reduce its spending. But the province needs to go beyond merely cutting spending to transform the way that services and programs are delivered. Healthcare, which represents 42% of the budget, provides an excellent example of spending more but getting less. If Alberta spent the same per capita as comparable provinces, it would spend $3.6 billion less each year on health care. Closing the spending gap requires moving more service delivery from hospitals to community-based facilities, more fully utilizing the skills of health care professionals beyond doctors and registered nurses, and changing the way doctors are paid and the amount they receive. Some services like day procedures should be moved from hospitals to private clinics to reduce costs and enhance patient service. More generally, the panel found that current collective agreements contain provisions that make it difficult for the province to provide quality, timely services at a reasonable cost. Thus, the panel recommends that the government make more use of not-for-profit and private sector delivery of programs and services. K-12 education represents 17% of the budget, and spending in this area has grown faster than the relevant school age population. The panel recommends that the government work with stakeholders to reduce the spending that goes to administration and governance. Also, the current funding formula should be changed to provide incentives for sharing services and achieving better student outcomes. In advanced education, which represents 11% of the budget, Alberta spends significantly more per student than comparable provinces, even though its participation rates are lower. The panel recommends that the government work with stakeholders to define the direction, the goals, and the appropriate governance for the sector. The panel also recommends that the government move to a revenue mix comparable to Ontario and British Columbia, where there is less reliance on government grants and more funding from alternative sources, including tuition. The province should also assess the financial viability of its 26 post-secondary institutions. In terms of the public sector, the panel believes that the public service needs to be renewed to enhance its capacity to be innovative and change-oriented. 
to support the attraction, engagement, and retention of qualified staff. The panel recommends that the management freeze on merit in-range increases be ended. Public sector compensation represents 55% of the budget. Public servants in Alberta have benefited from generous compensation and benefits, as well as job security during the recession. Thus, balancing the budget will necessitate restraint in the compensation and the size of the public sector. Capital spending is another major area in which Alberta's spending is well above other provinces. Alberta's net capital stock per capita is 44% above the national average. And capital grants to municipalities, which make up one quarter of the provincial spending on capital, are much higher than in other provinces. Thus, the panel recommends that the province examine its framework for capital funding to municipalities to align the funding with provincial goals, require municipalities to share more of the costs of major projects, and to bring Alberta's per capita capital stock in line with comparable provinces. As well as making specific changes in key areas, the panel recommends that the government conduct a principles-based program review across all government agencies and departments to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of government service delivery. Balancing the budget involves reducing spending, but also finding ways to grow and diversify, diversify the economy and enhance revenue. The panel found that Alberta has lost its competitive edge in attracting investment and is seen as being overregulated with lengthy processes and uncertain timelines. The panel recommends that the government work with industry and Albertans to develop a vision and strategy with clear, measurable targets to foster job and wealth creation and to rebuild Alberta's reputation as the best and most responsible place to do business. The panel believes that if the government moves quickly and decisively to reduce spending, transform program and service delivery, and promote economic growth and diversification, the budget can be balanced by 2022-23. The panel also recommends that to maintain the province's hard-earned fiscal health, annual increases in total program spending should be limited to the projected rate of increase in total household incomes, and that in-year spending be restricted for funding for real emergencies, disasters, or totally unseen events. Also, after balancing the budget, the province should build a formal buffer for its revenue forecasts and introduce a legislated plan to eliminate its debt by 2043-44. The panel's recommendations represent an ambitious plan to balance the province's budget and sustain its long-term fiscal health. Implementing it will require difficult choices and bold action. Challenging decisions will be required, but once the budget is balanced, there will be opportunities to reduce taxes and invest in new programs. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thank you for attending today. First, of all, uh, first off, I want to express uh, my appreciation uh, to the panel members for their work on this report and for the expertise uh, that they brought to this task. Uh, this esteemed six-member panel uh, really represents years of experience uh, with a variety of skill sets, uh, and I've really appreciated their service to this province. The members here today are, of course, uh, Dr. Janice McKinnon, um, former Saskatchewan Finance Minister, Executive Fellow at the University of Calgary School of Public Policy, and Professor of Fiscal Policy at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Mike Percy, uh, former Professor and Dean of the Alberta School of Business at the University of Alberta, as well as a former MLA. 
Kim Henderson, former Deputy Minister to the Premier, as well as Deputy Minister of Finance uh, with the province of British Columbia. Dave Mowat, former President and Chief Executive Officer uh, for the ATB Financial. Unable to join us uh, today are Bev Dalby, Distinguished Fellow and Research Director for the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary, and Jay Ramator, a former Deputy Minister for a number of ministries uh, within the Alberta Public Service. So again, just absolutely appreciate for the, uh, the great contribution that the panel members have made as they've uh, really worked on behalf of Albertans uh, over the course of, uh, of this summer. And despite the short timelines uh, required to finish this important work to inform Budget 2019, the panel rose to the occasion uh, and completed their work. And, and for that, I thank them. It was, a short, um, it was a short window to get this important work done. And I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't particularly acknowledge and thank <clears throat> Janice McKinnon for her leadership in developing this document. Thank you, Janice. I take the panel's comments seriously, and I'm very concerned about the state of our finances as revealed in the panel's report. This document clearly shows that Alberta has a serious long-term spending prog uh, <clears throat> problem. We spend much more than any other province, in fact, our spending has been consistently higher than the provincial average for the last 25 years. Previous governments spent more than they should have, much more than the usual practice of spending according to population growth plus inflation. There's one particularly notable fact that Dr. McKinnon shared that I would like to reiterate, as I believe this is something every Albertan needs to know and remember. And that is this, if our per capita spending matched the average spending in Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, our expenses would be $10.4 billion less than, than we have today, annually, and we would not have a deficit. Again, I'll repeat, if we kept our expenses on average to around what other provinces of similar size and economies did, we would not have a deficit. We'd ha we would have a healthy surplus that we could return to Albertans, use to pay down our debt, or sock away for a rainy day. Instead, we already have over $60 billion in debt. This is a clear case for change. We must bring our spending in line with other large provinces over time. What this report also shows is that all this extra spending doesn't mean we've seen better results. In some cases, in fact, we're seeing poor performance in key areas than the other comparator provinces. For example, despite spending on uh, the most per capita on the health system than any other Canadian province, too many of our actual health outcomes are the poorest of the comparable provinces. If we don't change direction now, our debt is on track to quickly grow to well over $100 billion and we won't be able to afford the services that Albertans need. The interest on this debt is already crowding out public services. We already spend more on interest, 1.9 billion, than we do on most government ministries. And if we don't change our ways, that will rise to 3.7 billion in just four years. Every Albertan and all of their children will be on the hook for these costs, just as they are now, on the hook for the 10.4 billion more in spending than Brit British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec on average. We must act now. Future generations and Albertans today are counting on us to make the decisions that will put us back on a solid fiscal path. Janice and team, thank you uh, for this report. I will use it as I continue to prepare a budget that will be tabled this fall. Thank you. All right, we'll now open the floor up for questions. Minister. Um I was just reading something. Uh, so uh, Trevor Toome, who's an economist at the University of Calgary, um, has kind of put together uh, an analysis that suggests that uh, our tax rates uh, are quite low, among the lowest in the country, and that if we were to raise taxes proportional to a province like Quebec, uh, we would actually see a budget surplus. If that's the case, and given that Alberta's um, got one of the you know highest incomes in the country, why are raising taxes completely off the question? Well, well, you know, quite frankly, I, I find that an amazing question uh, when we've just found out that we spend $10 billion more per capita compared to comparable provinces in this, in this country. We, we don't have a revenue problem, folks. We have a spending problem. 
I'm not asking about spending, I'm asking about um, why it's not on the table to increase revenue. He asked, he asked her as well. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. sure, yeah. sure, please. Well, as, as the uh, report says, would you do that in your household? If you were getting your car serviced and you were paying more than your neighbor and you're getting poorer results, would you just say, well, let's find more money? Or would you say the focus should be on what we're doing here, which is finding out why they're getting better results at a lower cost? So I think that when the panel was created, leaving taxes off was seen to me to be a time issue. We didn't have time. Having completed this exercise, leaving taxes for another day is the right thing to do because this is a spending problem, not a problem you should solve by raising taxes. On page 16 of your report, you, you cite, you cite the, this mandate. Well, the panel's mandate is not to opine on the makeup of revenues. To successfully manage the province's finances, steps need to be take, taken to increase stable resources, stable sources of revenue, and decrease the reliance on the volatile non resource revenues. That sounds like, uh, like it's, dis it's, it's addressing the tax issue. Um, how, how should one square what you said at the start of this, uh, of your presentation, yeah. that taxes aren't the entry? Well, because uh, why, why, that, why you have to find a more stable source of revenue is if you look, what are one of the roots of Alberta's spending problem? If you rely on non-renewable resource revenue, when you're in a boom, you spend to the boom, right? And then when the prices drop, you don't cut. So you have to find a way to even that out so you're not spending to the boom if the boom <laughs> ever comes again. So, so when you say we need to find, we need to increase stable source of revenue, does that mean we need to increase, so that doesn't mean we need to increase taxes? No, no, no. It, it means looking, and, and I think the government plans to do this, look at your whole revenue mix and see what the best revenue mix means, but not increasing the revenue mix. There is no evidence here to support the idea that Alberta is a province that should be raising taxes. Not a shred of evidence. The evidence all goes the other way. Alberta should be getting its spending in line, and it should be changing the way it does business. It doesn't manage program delivery as effectively as it could. Your mandate was not to look at that evidence, not to consider the whole tax, tax and revenue. Well, we didn't. Then. Yeah, yeah. But we said in future, somebody has to look at it because a cause, a, one of the causes of the overspending is things are going well, you spend up to the limit, the uh, economy tanks or declines, and then you have a spending, but you have a, a problem with the deficit. So you have to address it. And I think the government has said, I, you can ask the minister, that at some point they'll look at the revenue mix but not in terms of increasing the tax take to maybe reshuffling it in some way. I just want to go back to your metaphor, because you said, yeah. uh, would you pay more to get your car serviced than your neighbor? Yeah. I mean, Albertans, are, they earn a lot more than, than their neighbors generally. We're the highest paid province in the country. That drives up certain costs. Now, in terms of this comparison that you're making to other provinces, did you try to correct it at all for salary expectations. Frankly, an Albertan will not work for what a Quebecer will be paid. Um, and Alberta doctors are paid far more than Quebec doctors. No, we, we actually looked in, it, there's a part there, we looked at the cost of living in Alberta. It is not, is not more expensive to live here. And when we looked at other provinces, we looked at the, the salary scales in those provinces. And if you look at the salaries, the salaries, public sector salaries in Alberta are higher, virtually across the piece. One of the mistakes that Albertans have made in the past is they compare the public sector salaries to the private sector. That's not who you're competing with. Over 70% of your public sector are competing with other provinces. They're doctors, nurses, teachers, social workers. So you're competing with other provinces, not with the private sector. So what's happening in the private sector really has little influence on public sector salaries. If you compare it, you should compare it to other provinces. So you look at the budget, you don't want to... the budget in documents, it shows that, in fact, if Albertans live in British Columbia, they would actually pay, in aggregate, $11 billion more in taxes and they would pay even more in Saskatchewan. So I'm wondering, from the panel's point of view, is this purely and strictly a spending problem, or is it a spending and a revenue problem? I think it's a spending problem, and I think, I think it goes in two steps. And I think the government took the right two steps. First of all, you look at the spending. There is a spending problem here.
If you're spending 3.6 billion more per person in health and you have longer wait times, you have a problem. That something isn't working. And we detail there what isn't what has to change. You, 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 you use hospitals too much. You rely too much on just doctors. All of that has to change. So you get the spending problem under control. And then you look at the tax mix, and that will be up to another group of people, and the government will oversee that. But I don't think there's a case here for raising taxes. If you're going to cut spending on health care, students to pay we, we have the stomach to be responsible to the Albertans that elected us to bring this province to fiscal balance. Uh, we're, we're committed to that, uh, absolutely committed to that. Now, we were clear in our uh, during the election campaign that we were not going to uh, reduce uh, spending in education or health care, but in fact, look for efficiencies, uh, look for alternative ways of delivering service and, and improve frontline service delivery. Uh, and, and, of course, we know at the same time there's going to be great upward cost pressure in those ministries. And uh, certainly the, the panel report, I think, has done a very good job of, of laying out the need uh, to, to think about transformational change in the way we deliver all programs and services, but particularly health care. We're going to switch over to the phone lines right now, and then we'll come back to the floor. We just have a few of your colleagues on the line. So, moderator, could you please put forward the first caller? Our first question comes from Emma Graney of the Edmonton Journal. Your line is open. Yeah, get it, guys. Um, quick question here. Um, I think this would go to McKinnon. Um, hello. Um, I want to grab your idea here about tax cuts. I mean, you say in your book that this idea that tax cuts trigger economic growth proves to be simplistic arguments. So I, I'm curious as to how you're squaring that with what you're writing here in your report and also with what you're saying about the lack of tax cuts. Well, first of all, um, there, there are models developed. There's one at the University of Calgary, I don't know if it's public yet, uh, that models what um, a corporate tax cut would do to the economy. Uh, so that, and I'll tell you from my experience in Saskatchewan, when we balanced the budget, one of the things we did was reduce oil royalties so that they were lower than Alberta. And uh, the economy was part of the, the growth in the economy was part of the reason that we balanced the budget. So I think there's that. I think there's also the big issue that we <laughs> raised in our report. Alberta has lost its reputation as the most competitive place to invest. And you look across the piece, it's not doing as well as the rest of Canada and not doing as well as other parts of the world. So reducing the corporate tax can make economic sense, but it also can be something that corporations take seriously. Is it the only thing they consider? No, but it's targeting in unusual times, times of during the recession it was used, uh, in times of fiscal restraint it, it can be used. It's a way for the government to mandate a particular outcome in public sector salaries and say, here's the outcome that we want, it's consistent with our freeze in spending. It's consistent with the other data we have. Factor. I believe we have another what caller. On the, oh, sorry, Emma has a second sorry, question. I have Alternative ways to get there. That is, you might change a contract provision, which would be, get you to zero. So that's a, that's a tool used. I mentioned Manitoba. It's used by several uh, governments across Canada. The federal Nova recent ones, which was zero zero point seven five one. So, but what we said is that. Public sector salaries in Alberta are higher than comparable provinces, and they have to experience restraint. And so it has to be, it, if you're freezing spending, that has, a, has to occur across the public sector. And we recommended, though, the means to do it, the most effective means, is by using legislative mandates. And what figure, when you say legislative mandate, can you expand on what you mean and uh, yeah. try and attach some figures to it if you can? No, yeah, no, there aren't figures in there. Uh, so a legislative mandate, well, let me just talk about Manitoba. So you say for the next four years, public sector salaries will be this. Zero, zero, point seven, five, one was their, their mandate. And... Uh, so that applies to everybody. It applies to third parties, universities, et cetera. 
you haven't got the power to enforce it, but their grants are based on the assumption that their salary levels are the same as yours. It applies to arbitrations. It applies to back-to-work legislation. But the flexibility, so that you have to do two things. You have to say this is an unusual circumstance, and it is. Our report validates that, fiscal restraint. And you have to allow bargaining to get to zero, if it is zero in the case of Manitoba. How do you get there? And you can allow bargaining. So as I said, it's been used elsewhere. I think it's a very effective and reasonable tool to ensure that you have, if you have 55% of your spending that you're not like keeping flat, you can't balance the budget. And so restraint in that has to occur. And I think this is one of the most reasonable ways, and it's the one used most commonly in Canada to deal with it. All right, we'll turn it back over to the floor now. Mr. just further to that uh, like mandating, legislatively mandating wages, I mean, do you have a sense when that kind of legislation might be introduced? And is this um, some of the language introduced? Well, is... uh, for information as well. You know, I, I think uh, I want to be clear about this. We, um, I absolutely appreciate uh, the contribution our public sector makes in delivering frontline necessary services to Albertans. Uh, they're, they're a full partner in that effort. And, uh, you know, our point uh, was uh, we wanted to ensure that we were well informed uh, before we uh, continued with, uh, with uh, labour discussions with uh, the public sector, uh, before we entered into the next round of negotiating, and, and we're certainly taking the recommended uh, recommendations in this report seriously, and obviously at the same time we're working to develop a budget, and, and uh, those pieces will inform uh, our labour mandate going forward. Minister, um, there's a recommendation in here uh, that talks about any increase on non-bargaining staff with respect to providing merit or in-range increases to ensure the equitable treatment of all of our public sector resources. This sounds like you're lifting a cap on increases in pay to management while potentially warning that unionized workers might be getting laid off or having cuts. Is that, I guess, how do you, yeah. how do you explain that to workers yeah. who might be? I'll, I'll answer that. Okay, so <laughs> first of all, there's an equity issue. So managers include uh, many people, but also admin assistants. So you have admin assistants that are in the bargaining unit who have been eligible for up to 15% increase in their pay since 2015. You have managers that are admin assistants, low paid, that have had no increase since 2015. The other problem that we found when we talked to the department is they're losing people. You can't bring a junior person in in 2015 and you know they're, they're just a newly graduated engineer and they get promoted and promoted, but they can't get a salary increase until they leave the organization and get a better salary somewhere else. So you can't do that and have a qualified professional public service because you're just a training ground for other people. And it's not reasonable, you're just putting the managers on the same footing as the unions. The unions can get and regularly do get in-range merit increases, so you're making them equal. I have no idea why somebody decided that you could attract qualified managers by treating them less favorably than their union counterparts. So it, it's, I think it's an essential change to attract and keep the people you need, and you need highly qualified people to, to run this government. Yeah, and you said in the uh, you said at the outset that it is possible to balance the books by 2023-24. I guess how difficult is that going to be without making significant cuts? And if you were the finance minister of this province, where would you target? Well, I think I think you've kind of got a lot of it there. Uh, you, d you have to deal with public sector salaries, so you have to keep them flat or whatever. You have to deal with that. They can't continue to go up. You have to focus on health. It's 42% of the budget. And if you look at health, if there's one chapter I urge you to read, look at health, because it's clear why you're spending more and getting poorer results. And you have to make those changes. Fewer hospitals, more clinics, fewer doctors, more nurse practitioners, uh, using private clinics. Saskatchewan used private clinics for services. Costs reduced by 26%. Deal with the doctor's contract, the doctor's compensation, move doctors to an alternative way of being paid, as they do in Ontario. Um, and then you have the AHS review, which probably will get administrative savings. And again, in health, 
the, the salaries will be compressed. So those are the, the two big areas. But what I said about health, you should do across the piece. Because it wasn't as if there's one department here that's overspending. Every one we looked at, and we only looked at the big spenders, are spending more than other provinces. So across the piece, the government has to look at the areas that we didn't look at. Why are they spending more? What are the cost drivers? And what do we do to change it? To move Alberta closer to other provinces in its spending. We have time for one more set of questions. Can I just follow up to that, that one? And that's, uh, you had talked about private clinics. Yeah. I'm wondering if that would be just privately funded. Private yes. In all, well, the, the one in Saskatchewan, yeah. Yeah, it's, the government pays for the services, but people are diverted to the private clinics. And actually, in Saskatchewan, they found they liked them better because they didn't have to go to the hospital. They just drove there. Funded, yeah, private. they're publicly funded. Not yeah, funded. no, pro publicly funded. Okay, we're going to switch the phones for one last question. Um, and then, unfortunately, the minister and uh, Dr. McKinnon do have to get going. So, uh, moderator, could you put through the next caller, please? Our next question comes from Charles Lefebvre of Chat TV. Your line is open. Uh, my question is uh, for, for Minister Taves. Um, the, the, this is a report being released there. Could you talk about how much weight uh, your office and your ministry will be putting in on this report as you guys uh, put together the budget? Well, well, that's a good question. And, and we, uh, you know, we recognize uh, the expertise and experience uh, that this panel has. Uh, and so we'll be giving, uh, you know, we'll be putting a lot of stock uh, into these recommendations. There's no doubt about it. Obviously, we've been working on our own budget deliberations at the same time. Uh, we're going to be now be pulling both of those processes together and look forward to delivering uh, a budget this fall. I, I think, uh, it, and as well, if I can maybe pro provide a bit of perspective on, uh, on one of the questions related to the panel's recommendation of removing the freeze on uh, non-bargaining uh, management staff uh, that, that's that's a recommendation uh, by the panel that we will take very seriously. But but again, we've made no decisions uh, there. I think I want to be clear. I think the question was posed as though we've made a decision there. We've not made any decisions. But of course, we give full you know we're we're giving full deference to the panel report, and we're taking those recommendations seriously. And just a really quick follow up question. Uh, I know you've been saying that the budget's going to be tabled in the fall. Is there a specific date yet for when this budget will be tabled? Yeah, yeah, stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll look forward to releasing that in the future. All right. Thank you, everybody.